try and negotiate all well, because you know somebody's gonna come and try haggle on the try price. Try to ball you down mm -hmm. as we do in Jamaica. Well, the reality of it is, when you do that and you leave too much wiggle room, then you find that the property sits on the market because no one is willing to even look at it if they think it's overpriced. This episode is brought to you by the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean. Remax Jamaica presents the premier real estate conference and expo April 14 to 16 at the Jamaica Pegasus. Three exciting days, local and international speakers, over 80 booths, entertainment and more. Remax Jamaica premier real estate expo and conference April 14 to 16. Major sponsors, Pinnacle Development, Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Edgecam Jamaica Limited, RJR Gleaner Communications Group. Call us now at 876-835-1197. Visit the Remax website for more. True or false, you should always set the price of a property above market value. False, and that's just one of many myths about real estate. I'm Kalila Reynolds and welcome to The Property Source, powered by Remax Elite Realty. Now on this episode, Remax Elite agent Kamika Fullerton will debunk some common real estate myths. Hi, Kamika. Welcome to The Property Source. Hi, thanks for having me. They have Kamika Kalila. This should be pretty good. Yes, yes. Matching and all. Of course. So you're here to debunk some popular real estate myths. And one of them surrounds who pays the agent. Yes. So who does pay the agent? Okay, that's a good question. And that's something that I think a lot of people are quite worried about, um, especially buyers. So typically, the agent is paid by the seller. It is the seller who enters into a contract with the, the agent to market the property with a view to getting a buyer. So the seller usually has, uh, there are different kinds of listings that they can use. The typical one now that is used is the multi-listing service, the MLS listing, whereby the property is marketed by one agent. It is listed with one brokerage company, let me say that, and it appears on the platform that is used, it appears on the websites of other, um, it, other real, real estate companies or other brokerages. At the end of the transaction, that, that vendor is paying the person he contracts, which is the brokerage company that has listed the property. Mm -hmm. Unless, of course, they decide there could be a contract, because these are contracts. Mm -hmm. So it could be something which does not generally happen, where a buyer of, agrees to pay the realtor. That can happen, but typically, in majority of the cases, it's a seller it's who a will seller. pay the listing agent. And then the listing agent, if there is another agent who has found the buyer, for example, this, the, the listing agent, the back company, will pay a portion of the commission to that selling agent's company. Ah. So none of it is paid by the, by the buyer unless they choose to do so by virtue of agreeing to those terms in a contract. It does come in handy to know. So the next one is about pre-qualification. Always hear that you have to get pre-qualified, pre-qual, pre-qual, pre-qual. What's yes. the myth surrounding that and so what's there, the fact? There are so many. One of the things you hear is that you don't need to be pre-qualified. Now, the reality is you don't need to be pre-qualified, but it helps if you are. Some agents won't work with a buyer who has not been pre-qualified because you don't know if the person can actually afford any of the properties that they're looking at. Right. You don't know if they can afford anything. Um, so that's certainly a starting point for a realtor in working with a buyer to know what it is you can afford. And you need to know that too. You could be looking at a property that's really way outside your budget mm -hmm. and then you get disappointed when you start the process and you realize, wait, I can't finish this because I don't have enough, enough funds. So that's important. But another thing, people mistake the pre-qualification for actual mortgage approval. Oh. So you have situations where someone will get pre-qualified, which really is the bank's way of just doing a general assessment to say, okay, based on what you say you earn and what you spend, this is what we in theory, would be willing to give you. But it's not based on all the documentation. They haven't asked you for all your, all your bank statements, proof of your expenses, etc. So a lot more goes into the process when, you're, when you've started the transaction and you're about to be approved for a loan. There's also the issue that the property you're purchasing, while you may be qualified for a certain amount, the bank may be willing to lend you $40 million just based on your earnings and what they know or what they've seen from your documents that you can afford to pay back. But the property you want to buy may not be good security for the bank. Mm. So even though you can 
they can or they're willing to give you a mortgage of a certain amount, they're not prepared to give you a loan to buy that particular property. Whether the property has issues, whether the property isn't valued, you're buying a property that's valued less than what it is that you're paying for it. Oh. So there are different reasons that you may not, having been pre-qualified, you may still not be able to get approved for the loan. Wow. I never thought that could happen. I thought the pre-qualification was just as good as Definitely not. the guarantee you know, of the mortgage. And there are two things, actually, because there are banks that will give you a pre-qualification, which is a quick thing. They can probably give you in 24 hours. And then there's another called a pre-approval mm -hmm. where the, the, the documentation required for that is a little more rigorous. They would have looked a little deeper. But even with a pre-approval, circumstances could change. The pre-approval, for example, lasts for about 90 days for most banks. Things could have changed. Your situation could have changed in the 90 days. You could have lost your job. Something could have changed that made you no longer fit in the bank's eyes to be qualified or to be given a loan of a certain amount. So the, 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 the myth that because I'm pre-approved or I'm pre-qualified, it means I must get the loan. No, that's Are they not the same thing? The pre They're not pre entirely the same thing because the pre-qualification is a simpler one that just looks at basic things. Like you can go and get pre-qualified in about 24 hours based on just the basics you've shown your, your maybe your pay slip. Um, but when you go in for a pre-approval, they're a lot more rigorous. They ask for a lot more documents. They want to see a lot more proof. So that one tends to be a little stronger than the pre-qual, but it is still not foolproof because when you start the transaction, you could still find yourself not approved for the loan to buy the particular property. I had no idea. I thought you basically set once you have that letter. All right, next thing we always hear about is a big debate, renting versus buying. There are team renters and there are team buyers. What are the facts around this? Okay, so I say to this that it really depends. It depends on your circumstances. It depends on your finances. Um, it depends on your personality sometimes, but really your personal circumstances. What you must know, though, that investing in real estate, even on a small scale, is, almost, is, is one of the, the tried and true methods of earning, of, of gaining wealth, and especially generational wealth, if you want to call it that. So buying is always something that, you, 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 that is recommended, although you don't have to live in what you buy. Mm -hmm. Now, that's the thing. So renting, if you, for example, move around a lot, and you don't like to be fixed to one place. You, you, may, have, you may not have a family. You don't, you don't value a stable, set place that you need to stay at all times. And renting may be for you. It's easier if there is a broken pipe or broken anything. You just tell the landlord. It's usually for the landlord to fix. Or if it no longer suits you, the style is outdated, you no longer like it, you can move on. So it fits a lifestyle if you like to move, if you're, if you're not necessarily wanting to stay at the same place. And you don't want to shell out a lot of money. You can just pay this for rent and you move on. What you're paying for rent can very often be what you would pay for mortgage if you bought the property. But of course, you don't have to find that 10, 15 percent right. up front, right. the deposit and costs associated with it. Now, ownership is the, the, the decision to buy is usually for persons who you either want to make that investment because you're looking at future income. You can buy something and rent it out and mm -hmm. earn from it or you want to live in what you buy because you like that stability. You want the freedom to fix it as you want. You don't have to ask a landlord, can I knock out this wall? Can I paint it this color? You can do whatever you want with the property. So it certainly gives you that freedom to do whatever it is that you want. It comes with it, of course, the burden of, of maintenance right. um, and repair. So those are things you are now responsible for and they, they can be costly, but you can also do it at your own pace because you own it. Mm -hmm. And you can buy a property for one price. And by the time you're finished over the years, renovating and making changes, you can sell that property back for probably twice what you bought it mm -hmm. for. So it really depends. One of the, if you can manage though, to purchase even something small, let's say you are going, you can rent this property for 3000 US, but you can find somewhere comfortable to live that you are paying rent of a thousand US mm -hmm. right away. It's a win-win. Right. You have that $2,000 difference. You can later on sell the property because the property is still appreciating. So you're still going to be able to earn from the property and you still have the value in the property that is increasing. So really rent or buy, I still always buy. However, the decision to live mm -hmm. in 
what you what you buy is really where the debate is. Right, uh, right. So, so it Whether it's an investment property investment or you're going to live in that property. In and the other thing that people are, have a misconception about is at what point they own the property. So they don't realize that you do have equity in, in the, the property. property. So explain what that is and how it works. Okay, so having equity as opposed to you own the entire thing. You mean, it, for example, you've, bought, you've gotten a loan. The property is worth... $50 million, you have a $30 million loan. You have to remember that when you sell the property, you're not going to get $50 million in your hand because you have to sell, you have to pay back the bank what it is that you've borrowed from the bank and that difference is what you have. So having settled over time, you would have been paying the loan. So you would have been reducing how much you owe and the value of the property would have been increasing. Mm -hmm. So when you do sell, there is that difference. So what you have in it, that is what is not owed to the bank is the equity that you have that you can use to do other things, get another loan. It, it, there are other things you can do, but you have that equity in the property, which is so important. Right. As right. opposed to if you're renting, you really only have rights to occupy the property and nothing more. Right. The more you pay towards the loan, the, m the greater the percentage of the home that you now owe. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell, the more you end up with in hand. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, that to me is a very big one. People think that only at the point where the mortgage is completely paid off, do they have any ownership rights no, at all? Not at all, not at all. But you do own a you portion because you, you purchased. Right, you own it. You are the legal owner. But the bank does have a lien to the extent of what you owe them. So the quicker you can pay them off is the quicker you reduce any interest they have and that entire value will be yours. There's another myth around the selling process. Like if you watch these, these TV shows like HGTV and the TLC and the property flips and all of that, they're always doing the open houses. Mm -hmm. Is an open house necessary for selling? It's not necessary, but of course it allows the property to be marketed widely. It's an opportunity, when you see an open house, a buyer, a potential buyer doesn't even need to go in with an agent. You can just go and look at the property. So it gives the property more viewership in terms of persons being able to walk through. Um, is it absolutely necessary? No. And you will find, maybe if they did studies, I can't tell you what the percentage is. Not necessarily all the persons who come through your open house are in a position to purchase the property. Some are curious. Yeah, fast. <laughs> you know, you're fast, yes, exactly. <laughs> You just notice there's one down the road and you've always wanted to know what inside the property looks like. Let me go to the open mm -hmm. house. So you're going to have some of that. But it certainly exposes the property to persons who can even share it with others. Oh, you know, I saw that house down the road was selling and inside is nice, you know. So the, it, it, there are benefits to it. Is it an absolute necessity? No. Let's take a look at our property of the week. Welcome to another property tour. Today we're in Portmore, St. Catherine, Jamaica, and we will be looking at one of my listings that is on the market for rent. Now being featured today is this lovely 26,000 square feet commercial building that is on the market for rent. Upon entering, you can immediately see that the interior is just as lovely as the exterior of this building. Immediately, my attention is drawn to the recess lights that we have here. As well as above me, we have some lovely recess lights. I also love that we have all straight lines inside here. It is very contemporary, really clean design. Now, we just came through these large glass double doors, which adds some amount of flair to this building. So right here we have our stairs, it takes us all the way to the top of the building. We also have our elevator already installed. And here we have our stairs that takes you to the underground parking. So you can also access the building from this staircase. We're now on the second floor and very similar to downstairs, we have our elevator here and our staircase. To my right, is the utility room for this level. So the finish is, re is really dependent on the client that takes the space. This is the rooftop terrace where we have a 360 degree view of our surrounding areas. Absolutely beautiful. We can see the mountains. We can see close by infrastructures. Absolutely amazing. We can also see some residential communities. Now this space is ideal 
for our entertainment. I can see persons having lunch out here. I can also see this space being used for events, major events. With this view, <laughs> this is an ideal location. We are just off a number of major roads here in Portmore St. Catherine. And you know we have a number of highways leading to this location as well. Next one is around pricing. Mm -hmm. So um, there's this, I don't know if it's a misconception, you're gonna clarify that for me right now, but people feel like you must set the price all the way up here and then maybe you know you have your negotiation room or your wiggle room. Should I yes. always overvalue or overprice my property? So it is not recommended to overprice because guess what? When someone looks at it immediately, they're looking at what you're asking and they're not necessarily seeing the value in it and your property could really sit on the market for a long time if it's not properly priced. If you want your property to move, price it properly. I recommend a valuation. Sometimes agents can guide you on what may be a, bit a good price to sell. I recommend just getting a valuation so you know exactly what the market value is and you stick to that. You probably want to go no further than 10% above market value to account for the other things that you're going to have to pay, mm -hmm. pay like your realtor, etc. Yeah, but, but then how will I negotiate? How will, because you know somebody's going to come and try to haggle on the try price. Try to ball you down, as mm -hmm. we do in Jamaica. Well, the reality of it is when you do that and you leave too much wiggle room, then you find that the property sits on the market mm. because no one is willing to even look at it if they think it's overpriced. And then what comes with that? After you've seen a property sit on the market for so long, you think something must be wrong with it. Mm -hmm. So someone who That's could true. genuinely want a property in that area, seeing that that property is sitting on the market for so long, might think it must be that something is wrong why they don't want it. Mm -hmm. And guess what? That's when they start lowballing. Mm -hmm. Because now they start thinking, oh, they must be desperate because mm -hmm. it's on the market all this time now. And they start giving you the lower offers. So you're always advised. If you want your property to move, everybody does, time is money, price it properly. Price it as close at or as close to the market value as possible so that, that makes it makes sense. Work. Remember too, if you have overpriced the property and an interested buyer comes along and the buyer probably makes an offer on the basis of the high price that you that you have, have it on the market. When that buyer starts a mortgage process, let's say it's a mortgage buyer, the bank will not lend more than what the property is valued. It mm. doesn't matter what you're paying for it. So if the prop, if you're, you've agreed to pay $80 million for a property, you're selling your property for $80 million and someone has come along and they've agreed to buy it. But when a valuation is done, it's worth $60 million. Mm -hmm. That sale isn't going to go anywhere. Really? Because the bank is not going to lend the full $80 million or anywhere close to that. They'll lend nine, up to 90 or 95% of the value, not the sale price. Really? So you could find yourself wasting time on wasting more time on buyers who are not able to complete a sale at the exorbitant price you've put it at because the valuation doesn't sustain it and their bank will not lend. Wow. So it doesn't suit you at all to overprice it. I didn't know that because I always thought the value is just really what somebody is willing to pay. <laughs> it may be that, that that's one value, but the market value on which the bank uses, someone might place a certain value on it. I want to live beside my mother. So no matter how much that house is being sold for, I will pay it. Mm -hmm. If you're getting a, a loan from a bank, the bank isn't going to lend you just an infin infinite amount of money. It will be related to what the actual market value, what a reasonable person on the market would be willing to pay. Right. And that's because the bank has a lien on the property exactly. and the property is their collateral. That's the collateral. So if you, are, you default on your loan and they need to sell it, they need to be able to sell it and get what it is they've lent to you. Right. And if it's overpriced, then they're going to be, they won't be able to satisfy that security. So if you want to pay the inflated price, you have to come up with the rest yourself. Out of pocket. Yes. Oh, wow. Wow. All right. Going back to selling the property, we spoke about having an open house. What about staging? You always say that to like people put furniture to make it's it fancy look. fancy and nice. Yeah. And you know what? It's about the best look, giving the property the best look. So if you have a shirt that's on a rack, it's one thing, but if you see the shirt on a mannequin that perhaps looks like similar, a body type similar to yours, you can Im immediately see how that shirt might look on you. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with real estate. When you stage that property, it is showing the property in its best light and it's giving a buyer, a potential buyer, because you're doing this to get buyers, eh? It's giving the potential buyer an idea of how the property could look 
if they were to live in it. Mm -hmm. It looks more livable. When you see a property that's empty, you're going to an empty house. You probably can't visualize. Not all buyers can visualize how they would want the property to look, how they would set it up. So staging it allows you to see it in the best possible light. It gives ideas to a buyer as to how it could be used. And it certainly helps with the marketing of the property. Mm -hmm. Can I get more from my property if I stage it? You will get an offer more quickly, is what mm -hmm. I'm prepared to say. Not necessarily a better offer, but because time is money, getting that offer today, as opposed to waiting several more months for it, certainly has value. Okay, what about renovation? Like This seems like a no-brainer to me, that if I renovate my property, I can get more money for it. Well, you would only do that if there is value, if what you're doing is going to add value. So some people want to engage in a whole scale renovation of the property that might cost them more than the increase in value, and that would not be worth it. Keep in mind as well, some buyers might be buying a property and want to put their own personal touch to it. Mm -hmm. So when you go and you put in the tiles that are attractive to you, um, and personalize it in a certain way, it may not suit a buyer mm -hmm. who is looking, who is probably quite prepared to gut that property and set it up the way they want. So only if the reno renovation is going to add value to the property, would it be recommended that you go ahead and do it? So what types of renovations should we look at? If you're looking to renovate, for example, the kitchen, mm -hmm. the bathroom, um, those are things that can add value because they're, they're, they're increasing the value of the property. Um, adding a room, if it is that you want to do that. Keep in mind, persons buying may want to do things differently. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to do that, the specific thing that you're thinking about doing, I'd recommend you talk to your realtor ab about it. Your realtor can help guide you on whether this in fact would be something that is in demand um, for example, a, a ground floor bedroom. A lot of people want ground floor be bedrooms because as you get older, you right. may have an older parent and it's harder to go up the stairs. If that's what you're doing, then that definitely can add value, real value to a property. So talk to your realtor about what it is you want to do. So you can have a discussion about whether it actually will add value or whether it's really just wasted money, g g giving you back a net, a, a, a net nil. Is that why everything's always painted white? Basic, keeping it basic because you may love purple like I do, <laughs> but not everybody does. So keeping it at a, at a color that is easy and that people can easily change and see themselves in, you know, keeping it light, that's always best. Well, any other myths that you can think of that need to be busted right now? Mm. One of them, I must say, because I'm an attorney as well, I have to put this in, the concept that you don't need to get your own attorney because the bank has mm, one, yes. or the bank's attorney is yours, no. Remember that you are entering into a contract where once you break that contract, there are consequences, financial consequences. So you want to ensure that you have your own team, including your own attorney, who will be able to guide you on that process before you reach the bank. Yes, the bank is going to ensure that the property is suitable security for them. So there are certain things they're in going to inquire into. But the protection that you need in the negotiation stage, you can only get that when you have your own attorney. So always best. And the, the concept too of, oh, I can use the seller's attorney, not recommended. It is always better to have your own so that there is impartial, independent advice that you're getting and there's no conflict of interest. Mm, so buyer and seller get your own, own attorney. Attorneys, own attorneys. How much does that typically cost? The, the typical market rate for attorneys is 3%, but you, there sometimes can be negotiation. The higher the price, then there is room for negotiation. The price of the property. The price of the property, yes. Ah, uh, yes, because that 3% is going to be going to add up to, to more. Yes, but you don't want to be pe penny wise and pound foolish. That's this true. This is the biggest investment you're going to make. There are not many things you're going to spend $30, $40 million for in your mm -hmm. lifetime that are not real estate. So you want to protect that money, and it's better to do that. Get a qualified, experienced attorney who knows real estate. Who I can was really just going to ask can it be any attorney, or are there specialized attorneys that I should look for. So experience counts for a lot of things. Um, we may all have the same qualifications, but experience counts for a lot. If you have a problem with your heart, you're not going to necessarily ask a foot doctor to give you advice on it. So go to someone who has experience in that field. And in this case, it would be conveyancing real estate. Conveyancing. conveyancing. So that's what you should ask for. A conveyancing attorney. Yes. Ah, OK. Well, thank you so much, Kamika. Appreciate welcome. it. 
Are you considering transferring to an internationally accredited university? No need to look any further. Make the right choice by transferring to the UCC. Undergraduate students who have successfully completed college courses at another institution may transfer their credits at any time to the UCC in order to complete an accredited degree and gain access to very attractive career opportunities available to current students and graduates. Our local, regional, and international career services partners will work closely with each student to explore and identify high-paying virtual and in-person career opportunities, jobs, and internships across the Caribbean and the U.S. Visit our website, ucc.edu.jm, for details. Remax Jamaica presents the premier real estate conference and expo April 14 to 16 at the Jamaica Pegasus. Three exciting days, local and international speakers, over 80 booths, entertainment, and more. Remax Jamaica premier real estate expo and conference April 14 to 16. Major sponsors, Pinnacle Development, Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation, Edgecam Jamaica Limited, RJR Gleaner Communications Group. Call us now at 876-835-1197. Visit the Remax website for more. That's it for this episode of The Property Source, powered by Remax Elite Realty. Follow Remax Elite Realty all over social media. And remember to like this video and share with your friends. Also, subscribe to this channel to keep up with all things real estate. I'm Kalila Reynolds. Let's get this money. <laughs> this episode was brought to you by the University of the Commonwealth Caribbean.